Welcome to the Design Materials channel. I'm Edson Mafus, architect and professor of architectural design at the School of Architecture, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre, Brazil. I'm back with another video on architectural design, this time to deal directly with the theme that gives the channel its name. First, I would like to stress a definition of architectural design, of architectural project that stands at the base, at the foundation of everything that is done and it is going to be done in this channel. And this means that the architectural project is a formal synthesis of the three elements that appear in all design situations. There are the program, the place, and the construction techniques. And these are th synthesized in a form by the application of the design materials that we take, transform, and adapt from history. So, architectural design is essentially a transformation and adaptation of precedents to new and different situations. And to be more precise, the design materials, which are accumulated in a repertory through the centuries, are basically formal strategies of spatial organization, which is an abstract element, plus specific concrete elements that can be used to materialize those formal strategies. I'd like to begin with this advice that Viole Leduc gives to students of architecture. Viole Leduc, for those who don't know him, was a very important architect in the 19th century, in the, especially in the field of conservation of historical monuments. He was the, the architect responsible for the last uh, last conversion or the last uh, restoration of the Notre Dame Cathedral, the one that burned uh, last year in Paris. And he said, in, in other words, to students that the first step in any project should be to investigate how the subject in question was treated by other architects and then start from there. That is, never start from zero, never start from nothing. You have to start always from someone, from some good solution that someone did before you. This was common practice before the, ninth, the 20th century and even within modern architecture. A very good example of this is the work of Palladio. Palladio is an architect who works in the northern area of Italy, in the area of Vicenza, Verona, and Venice. He, one of his uh, activities was to go to Rome to measure and to draw the old buildings from the Roman Empire. He learned a lot from it and was able to create some real inventions in architecture, something which is very difficult because uh, almost everything has been invented. One of these inventions was to transfer the pediment plus columns usually found in religious Roman buildings to domestic architecture. This can be seen in the many villas he built and designed, like here, 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 and also he started to use the windows that are common in uh, baths in Rome, like this one, which, be, which came to be called the thermal window and was widely used from Palladio's time onwards. This marvelous picture, whose author is an architect called Carl Lobbing, shows that Palladio produced so much that it, it is possible to 
to create a kind of small village of palladium buildings. A few centuries later, there came Jean-Nicolas Louis Dirin, a very important professor at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, who was the responsible for the first systematization of architectural knowledge and one of the first to put down a system of design. He was responsible for teaching engineers who would go to the French colonies to build official buildings. And this also had effects in Brazil because in 1815, when uh, the Portuguese crown sent what was called a, a cultural mission to Brazil, there were some French architects and it is known that they brought with them the, the main book wrote by Durin, which is the one on the right in the picture. But going back some years, in 1800, he published this book on the left, which is called Collection and Parallel of Buildings of All Kind, Old and Modern. It's a, it's a kind of repertory. In this book, there appear all the most important buildings built before 1800. It was a kind of a kind of reservoir of knowledge which was to be applied using the second book, the one published in 1809, the Précis des leçons d'architecture donné à l'école polytechnique. In this book, Jihan would teach, or with this book, would teach his students what were the necessary steps to create a good design, which is here, and he would give them information about all sorts of things, about whole plans, about technical matters like, like uh, roof construction, like vaults, like the orders, and he would go on to consider in an abstract way how you could start from the very elementary forms like the, the square, the parallelogram, the circle, and combine them and generate buildings from them. From this abstract way to, to uh, showing how, for instance, the square could be manipulated, subdivided, and turned into several kinds of buildings. He would offer them these configurations in a very generic way. No program was involved in which allowed the, the students and engineers to adapt these configurations to many, many programs that they could be involved with in the future. But this, if you think this is something that happened only before the 20th century, you're wrong. You see that in the, the work of the moderns, for, for example, Frank Lloyd Wright, who could be said to be perhaps the first modern architecture. You can see in this house, the, the Martin House in Buffalo of 1904, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, you can see that even though the appearance of the house is not old or pre-modern, if you look carefully at the plan, you'll see the presence of some elements of, of uh, historic architecture, namely symmetries. In this case, the symmetry doesn't control the whole project, but you can find localized symmetries here in the janitor's lodge, in the, the entrance pavilion, in most important here in the living area of the house, which is organized around this axis here that connects the porch with the chimney piece. Also, in Ms. van der Rohe's work, you find the same thing. You look at these steel and glass boxes, and sometimes you don't perceive that these uh, diaphanous pavilions have a plan that is regular and symmetrical, which are 
features of the, the architecture they were trying to leave behind. Even Le Corbusier, but in, the, in Le Corbusier's case, it's not that surprising because in his writings of the beginning of the century, he was already uh, referring to Michelangelo making drawings of ancient Rome. But when you look at these two pictures, you don't see immediately the relation between them. It took a very important uh, thinker, architectural thinker, in 1948 to point out the relationship between the Villa Stein and the Villa Malcontenta of Palladio. Colin Rowe, in 1948, wrote an article with the title the mathematics of the ideal villa. It was a sort of scandal because at that point it was almost taboo to say that a modern architect was taking inspiration from <laughs> classical or classically inspired architecture. But you can see what he's doing here. He's comparing the two plans in terms of the the basic diagram of the Palladian villas, something which will appear in a minute. And he shows that while Palladio would, would uh, build over some of the lines of the, of the scheme thick walls, which were everything in pre-modern architecture, all the subsystems would would come to the walls, the walls would do everything, subdivide, enclose space, uh, be the structure. In the case of Le Corbusier, he was already working in a time where the where independent structure was king. And we see that instead of having walls all around, he has some, some kind of some, uh, wall stretches, but then in many places what he does is to put a column where two lines of the, the scheme cross and if you look carefully at the plan you immediately realize that it, it's almost impossible that Le Corbusier didn't know the connection because here you have his plan subdivided the same way as Palladius and you have his one of his stairways exactly over over the the band where Palladio put his service spaces so they, they coincide here and even though on the left this other stairway is not exactly on the strip the service strip you get access to it by it. So it opens to the service strip. And the main living room is occupying exactly the central strip, which is the same as in Palladio. There are some other connections, which is not the case to go into right here, but I think you get the point that Le Corbusier was no fool and he he used to to take lessons from the the history of architecture another one which is not appear he, appearing here is the connection between the the, the parliament building in Chandigarh and Schinkel's Altes Museum which is, which is the same thing as we are seeing here same scheme built in a modern way well this notion of design as transformation and adaptation of precedents that we are trying to to make clear here is totally connected to a way of thinking about architecture as craft because it has all to do with it it is evolutionary it comes from what came before it provides by it, historical continuity, it's always positive to its context and tries to work with it, tends to be a kind of silent and correct architecture, and because of that is culturally relevant. And most important, it's 
pro city it builds the city it's not working against the city as much of the architecture of the spectacle of of today is so we can say with Elio Pignon that architecture comes from architecture itself Elio Pignon is so in favor of this thinking that he wrote a book called Design as Reconstruction. Here you see the cover of the book, which was published in Spanish, and in which he says many times that in design, rather than to arrive to a building, one starts from one. This is exactly what Viollet le Duc was saying uh, as a century and a half ago. And another important thing said by Pignon is that many architects fall into the trap of thinking they are composers when at best they are interpreters. Architects in general are not very humble and they always think they can be the next, the next genius. Whereas in general most architects are well trained to do correct and middle of the road work and should be happy with it. The, the attempt to be a genius fills the city with monsters that only detract from good quality in city building. But even, even though there are so many uh, evidences that great architects started from history, in their projects, why are so many architects unwilling to use them, at least in, a, in an explicit way? I would say there are four reasons for that. One that is, is the fear of having one's creativity limited. However, it's impossible to imitate. Since the original situation in the one to which the precedent is transposed are always different. Place, program, and technique, at least one is different, but it is normal for every one of them to be. The scale of the precedent and that of the new object are also often different. Therefore, the result will always be a unique object. Even when the objective is to build an exact replica, this is a commission rarely accept, accepted by architects, who are usually interested in creating their own interpretation of any theme. It is well known that a former Robert Venturi client, for whom he had built several houses, asked him to build a replica of Mount Vernon, the house of George Washington near Washington, D.C., which is the one we see here at the bottom. Venturi designed a very personal version, full of irony and distortions, that was not accepted by the, the client, who later found another professional who built the desired replica. The second reason is that is that based on modernist preaching which proposed a break with the architecture of the past, or at least with its appearance, a very difficult thing to do, as the evidence shows. The third reason would be the dissemination of the notion that architecture is art. Many architects go around saying that they are artists and that all they do is art. In truth, architecture is not art, although it contains an artistic component, which resides in the way an architect may synthesize so many conflicting aspects of a design problem in a transcendent way. It doesn't always happen. Architecture is an attribute that buildings may or may not have. This means that not all buildings are architecture. 
what, differ what differentiates architecture and art is the question of use and the commitment of architecture to the city, which greatly limits what the architect can do. Whereas art is an activity without limitations, working on self-imposed problems. The fourth reason for that unwillingness is the lack of a conceptual tool to gain access to history. Modern architecture did not have such a conceptual tool that would allow it to appropriate history, although such a thing had already existed for a century. They had probably forgotten about Quatremer de Cancy or ignored him because he was an academic. However, what he has developed is very important. It is the key to opening up the repertory of universal architecture for its proper use. And this is the concept of type, developed and published by Antoine Chrysostome Quatremer de Cancy in 1832 in the Dictionnaire of Historical Architecture, which was part of the famous Encyclopédie Méthodique published by the French Diderot and D'Alembert, who intended to gather all knowledge in one single collection which was obviously something utopian. No? But this definition is very, very important because not only does it define the concept of type, but also its companion concept, which is that of the model. And here in yellow, we can see that he says that the idea the type is the idea of an element that should serve as a rule for the model. The type is a principle. A principle that is always behind everything that is built. In the model, everything is precise and given. In type, everything is vague. Perhaps a good way of looking at or, or trying to understand the concept of type is looking at things outside architecture and then to come back to architecture. But before, let me just show you how the concept or by whom the concept of type was recovered in the 20th century. After being forgotten by the moderns, uh, during the decade in which uh, Orthodox modern architecture started to be to be questioned. Uh, Giulio Carlo Argan, an Italian historian who uh, reached or who became the mayor of Rome at some point, was the first to talk about the concept of time in the 20th century, as far as we know. After him, the concept appeared discussed in the context of the city in the famous book by Aldo Rossi, The Architecture of the City. Later on, uh, Rafael Moneo, another important European architect, taught in Harvard, taught in Barcelona, in Madrid, wrote a lengthy article on it. Alan, Alan Cohun also dedicated some time to it. And there are two whole books that treat the subject, one by the Argentinian professor Alfonso Corona Martinez, very good book, and the, the main one, the, the one that treats the subject in the most interesting way is the one by Carlos Martí, a professor at the, the school in Barcelona. And it, I say that it's the best one because he deals with type from the point of view of the designer from the point of view of the application of types to design. And he does that through a going from, or from very old examples to contemporary examples. It's a great book and deserves to be read. 
But going back to the subject, I would like to invite you to consider the idea of a spoon. What's a spoon? The definition from the dictionary says that there is an implement consisting of a small, shallow, oval or round bowl and a long handle, used for eating, stirring and serving food. This definition, very, very succinct, of a, a bowl and a handle is the type, is a principle. You can, you can build a thousand spoons from it. And you can see around six kinds of spoons, all of them follow the principle, handle, bowl, but using different shapes, different materials, different colors. For instance, here two materials are combined. Here the, the bowls are more or less oval. Here they take the shape of a heart. So I think this allows one to understand better what's the type and what's the model. The, the actual spoons are models, are concrete examples of the materialization of the principle. The principle is spoon equals handle plus bowl. The models are the actual spoons. Just to reinforce the discussion, let's look at cars. The, the so-called saloon car, or in Europe, a sedan car, is a passenger car, generally referred to as the, a tree box car, because there is the the baggage area, the engine area, and the area where the passengers go. So it's a kind of three volume car. And this scheme defines the cheap cars and the very expensive cars. All of them are saloon cars, but from totally different categories and prices. Going back to architecture and going back to our dear Palladio, we see what I had mentioned before, the famous plate from the book by Whitcower, in which he shows us for the first time what is behind the plans of so many villas designed by Palladio. This diagram in yellow here, which is a rectangle divided vert vertically in three equal strips and horizontally in five being two of them narrower and dedicated to service. Well, that, we have to take this in a, with a, a bit of salt because at, in the 16th century, service was perhaps little more than stairways. Know, the, the rooms were not specialized as they are today. But in general, the, the central strip is where the main rooms go, and the narrow strips is where uh, stairways and kitchens and, and deposits go. And you can see that looking at all these plans here, all of them show a different variation of the main scheme, which is the scheme that appears underneath the Villa Stein by Le Corbusier. So, type allow us to be connected to the history and tradition of our discipline. It allows us to extract the essence with which we will design. And it's important to, to stress that what should interest us in history is the substance of history, not the appearance. When we're looking at, we are looking at history, the important thing is the criteria for, for the projects, not the solution itself. That is substance, not appearance. And perhaps what was wrong with postmodern architecture of the 1980s was the fact that they were more interested in the appearance of historic buildings than their substance. That's why so many funny-looking buildings were built. Let's wrap up with a short series of examples of the use of the, the historic 
repertoire in architecture, beginning with two two examples from the Spanish architect Alberto Campo Baeza, one of the greatest architects of this time, in which he designs a house called Casa Rotonda, a name given by himself to the to his project, which which already signals that he is looking at Palladio's Villa Rotonda. The, the, the facades don't give out much information. It doesn't appear it doesn't appear that they have any relation whatsoever. But when you look at the plans, you see that the new rotonda is also based on a square. It has a, a round space in the middle, although the, the roundness has to do with the ceiling much more than to the shape of the room. There is a kind of uh, adapted symmetry. It's not a totally symmetrical plan like Palladio because here we are 500 years later. We have to adapt a lot of other uh, functions here. We have to put a lift. We have uh, subsidiary spaces, but in general the plan is symmetrical. And where in Palladio's example there are porticos and stairs all around in a symmetrical situation regarding both axes, in Campo Baeza's project what we have are courts, recessed courts, which are dis distributed in the same way as the porticos and stairways of Palladio. And when we see the two models, again, at first we see no relation, but then we see that there is a central, central block which is surrounded by elements in a certain way. We see a certain familiarity. They are different buildings, but they they belong to a line of development. And I'm sure that this one was only possible because the architect knew the Villa Rotonda by Palladio. The second example by Campo Baeza is what he does with something he takes from Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier not only inspired was inspired by history, but by himself he has inspired many architects in all parts of the world. In this case, Campo Baeza takes from the Villa Cook something that uh, Le Corbusier uses, and I don't think he developed it that much, which is the diagonal relation between two double height spaces, which appear here in these two sections of the Villa Cook. Campo Baeza takes it ahead and builds a series of houses in which you see this expansion, diagonal expansion of the space, which also serves to improve the lighting conditions of the space. This is the first one, one of, one of his first houses, the Turegano house. Then there came the Asensio house, in which the spaces are slightly bigger than the first one, and then the third one, in which he introduces a third space. It's very, very difficult to get a picture that could encompass the three of them. Fortunately, we have this shot of the, of the model in which we see the two spaces, like in the other one, but a third one. It's really an interesting development development with light coming from all sources, creating a complex space, which is the result of the of the grouping of normal square spaces. And to end this video, I would like to, to discuss a project by Elio Pignon, an architect much admired, who will appear many times in the series that will come. And this is his attempt at doing something inspired by a project by Norman Foster. He sees a tower by Foster in Madrid, a built tower called Sepsa Tower, essentially a tower with side course, side service course, and a free plan in between. What he does, which is already 
evident in its difference is a tower with one service core, one external service core, and uh, just to prove once more that imitation is impossible, he starts from something he saw, and immediately we see the differences. Instead of two cores, we have one core. Uh, the, the kind of structure that the Foster Tower has is uh, a structure based on the two cores, but also on columns inside the flexible space. In Pignon's case, you have the, the main core up here, and then four columns for external columns and no structure inside the flexible space. It's, it's a different build. He couples that with elements. First, we talked about formal structure, a way of organizing the space that he takes partially from Foster. Then he couples that with two elements he takes from the work of an architect he admires very much, Mario Roberto Alvarez, an Argentine architect. And these elements are paired columns, not only paired columns, but each column has a recess which uh, takes away the, 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 this notion of heavy column. The column, because of this recess, becomes less of a, of a heavy thing and gain some delicacy. And the other element, the other element is the way the, this building, this residential building, is topped up. Uh, Alvarez takes the columns beyond the last floor in order to support a last slab, which not only crowns the building, but also serves to uh, to improve the way you perceive the elements on the top of the building, which have to do with water reservoir, with technical elements like air conditioning or the, the, the elevator engine, etc. And solves the problem, the permanent problem of how to end a building. Going back to Pignon, we see in this partial view how the these big pillars become less of a heavy thing because of the recess. And here we see the, the group, the group of towers proposed by Pignon, which are a, a, a unique creation that starts with elements from Foster and Alvarez and end up being pure Pignon. And here we could maybe remark that the way he distributes the three towers on the, on the terrain is what we call the jump of the the jump of the horse in the in the chess game, which is something we will deal with in future videos. I'd like to end with a, a quote from T.S. Eliot in The Sacred Wood when he talked about poets and, and the fact that poets imitate and how they imitate. He says that immature poets imitate, mature poets steal, bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better or at least something different. In this case, we could say that Campo Baeza and Pignon are the good poets that Eliot mentions here. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you come back. And do not forget to subscribe to be informed of the next videos. So long.